All right, what's up, everyone? Uh, so I've noticed that in philosophy circles, um, one issue that seems to be like considered settled by like a lot of people, um, like one, this is definitely one we've disproven, um, is the notion of free will. And it's almost like we don't need to discuss it any further because it's already been established that free will doesn't exist. You don't have free will. No matter how you construe it, um, there's no way to produce free will in the kind of universe we live in. Now, I've made my position before, um, but I think I've deleted that video since, um, that I definitely do believe in free will. Now I take this position after considering a genuinely large number of arguments for the counterposition. You know, ultimately, this position is still kind of up in the air. I can't definitively say that I've conclusively proven that free will exists. Uh, but anyways, the, the, the kind of premises that I lay out about free will do kind of make some assumptions. Um, and I'm claiming that these assumptions, uh, you know, easily demonstrate that free will can be like a definitive, definitive thing, like absolutely proven. And uh, in this video, I hope to explain the argument as well as kind of go over some of the counter arguments that I see and explain the flaws in them or what I believe to be the flaws in them. Now, some of the things I may say might sound a bit strange to people who are new to this channel and kind of don't underlie some of the philosophical premises you need in order to understand what the hell I'm talking about, because I do talk about very abstract stuff. Um, and a lot of like the, um, the kind of preconceptions you need to understand what I'm saying uh, are very bizarre and out there and like most people just don't encounter those like kind of ideas naturally. But anyways, to make my argument, what I'm going to do is like put forth certain premises and then explain what I mean by them. And the first premise that I want to say, premise number one, you do have free will. Um, okay, now for this premise to make sense, we need to find exactly what I mean by free will because often you find examples of people defining free will in kind of arbitrary ways and then proving or disproving the existence of that version of free will. Free will, as we're going to define it for the purpose of the video, and I think something that everybody can you know, agree makes sense as the definition, is the power of acting without the constraint of necessity or fate. The ability to act at one's own discretion. In other words, free will is the ability to make decisions and act in the world freely. Now, this is all we need to know in terms of the definition of free will. Um, but I want to also clarify something right away is that determinism is often uh, portrayed as like the opposite of free will. You either have free will or you have determinism. Now, the thing is, I actually think this is a false dichotomy. You can actually live in a deterministic world universe and have free will. Um, now, of course, you might have various arguments against that. And I'll actually get to those soon. But for right now, I just want to posit that consider that this is possibly a false dichotomy in that uh, they're not inherently mutually uh, exclusive to each other. Now, the second thing we need to more to define is you because the idea is you have free will. So we have to make sure we, we all agree on what we mean by you. And this is actually a lot more complicated uh, than, than it seems. <laughs> Are you like the collection of atoms that makes up yourself uh, and that makes up your body? Now, for actually for the sake of this argument, we won't consider that to be you. Um, yes, you're composed of a million atoms and they're a part of your body, but we're actually considering that to be separate from you because the part of you in order for free will to make sense that has free will is your psyche. Um, now th this is exactly where, where, why defining our terms is so important because it's never defined clearly what exactly uh, what we mean by you. So what I'm claiming is that your psyche has free will. Um, but what exactly does that mean? This is a difficult concept for most people I find, especially if you've never thought about it before. Uh, but basically what I'm saying is that the part of you, you would consider your mind, like your imaginative capacity, your capacity to experience the world and be conscious of things. Um, the fact that you're experiencing the world subjectively, that part of you, that, that psychic part of you is what I call it. Um, is the thing that has free will. It has free will over the material world in a sense. If you're unfamiliar with the idea of qualia and mind, um, take the example of pain. Pain is obviously something that involves a lot of material changes and chemical changes in the body and the brain. Um, but the, those physical changes in and of themselves aren't the pain itself. Pain is a, a subjective experience and it's not exactly clear what that subjective experience is, but you feel it and you, but, and, and so in a sense, it definitely does exist, but it kind of exists in a sense apart from matter. Yes. You know, physical changes are associated with the experience of pain, but the experience of pain is something in and of itself. Another example, which is a bit more less abstract perhaps are your thoughts. What are your thoughts? Again, a materials would, a materialist would say that your thoughts are just neurons firing in your brains. And yes, neurons are firing in your brains, but think about it. Like literally think about it. Just sit there and think. You can hear a voice in your head, right? If you're thinking with words, for example, if you're thinking with images, you see the images in your mind, right? But what are those in and of themselves? Yes, neurons are firing to produce them, but like the actual thoughts themselves, um, you can think of this thought experiment. Like imagine if I opened somebody's head and I could see every single neuron, every single connection, everything going on, and I can track it all in real time. Would that be enough information to tell me what the person is thinking? The, the fact that this is so ambiguous shows that there is something unique about psyche. It's something slightly different. I'm not saying um, 
you know, necessarily that it's disconnected from matter. It probably is connected in, to matter in some way. In fact, matter probably gives rise to the psyche. But this is, you know, the idea of um, emergence. The fact that simple systems can give rise to higher things and those higher things can actually then kind of exert influence on those lower systems. What I'm claiming has free will is the psyche itself. That kind of subjective side of you is the thing that exerts its free will. Premise number two, this one's a bit weird, but actually you don't have one free will, but several. This is because your psyche isn't actually always a unified entity. Um, it can be divided into various subcomponents and all of these subcomponents have a measure of free will. Let's just say for some reason you're on the nofap train and you're scrolling through YouTube and then you see a thumbnail of a really hot girl. Um, now a part of yourself is obviously telling you to click the video because it's kind of like a natural instinct and we just naturally are, you know, compelled to do that. Um, but then another part of you tells you that you shouldn't do it because you're, you've made a commitment to this particular ideal, um, and you want to fulfill it. So you're kind of in this split brain where part of you wants to and part of you doesn't. Um, now what I'm claiming is kind of bizarre, but I'm, what I'm saying is both of these aspects of you have free will. So Matt, no matter which decision you make, um, either you, either you click on the video or don't click on the video. Either way, your psyche, a part of it, decided for you. Both of them are technically you, um, but it's kind of like uh, these psychic components can also have a measure of their own independent free will. Now, again, I pro this probably sounds extremely confusing and counterintuitive, but it kind of it kind of does make perfect sense. Another kind of prediction from this idea is that one part can overpower the other and in a sense kind of exert its free will over another and reduce its free will. But that brings me to my next premise, which is the amount of free will is quantifiable. It isn't something which you either have or don't have, but rather it's something which you have in varying degree. The claim is, is that free will isn't like a thing you either have or don't have. It's actually like a quantity, like you have a certain amount. In fact, each psychic entity that I discussed earlier, like those different parts of your psyche has a certain degree of free will. Uh, no entity has absolute free will, but every entity does have some. And we can even quantify the, uh, another way to quantify the free will would possibly be also as a percentage of the total free will of a system. Some of the implications of this though are jarring. For example, just because you have free will um, doesn't mean that you can necessarily do anything with it. Your free will might not be strong enough to actually pursue the thing that you're willing. It also implies possibly that some people have more free will than others. Um, in fact, this is exactly what it's implying. Some people, um, depending on their circumstances, will be enabled more free will than other people, depending on their circumstances. And for example, a human has more free will uh, than most other animals, it would seem. And you can even envision, envision entities that are kind of so complex in kind of their minds and how they think that they would have more and more free will, leading up to like the greatest possible entity that could have this the maximum amount of free will. Um, and again, an entity like that can actually exist for reasons which I'll explain towards, towards the end. And in fact, if an entity like this did exist, it would effectively mean everybody else losing their free will. Another implication of this is that free wills can oppose each other. And this may clarify what I meant earlier that the fact that um, you either clicking on the video on NoFap or not clicking the video, um, either in either case you had free will. It's just that one free will subtracted the free will of the other thing um, and that's how it was able to kind of overcome. So either your uh, higher intentions were able to overcome your id or your id was able to overcome your higher intentions. Both have free will, but they're kind of pulling in opposite directions. And because they have different goals, their free wills kind of contradict each other um, and it leads to reduction in both where ultimately only one can prevail. Um, either you don't click on the video or you do click on the video. And I, you know, I hope that like, again, uh, some of these premises may sound very bizarre, but hopefully you see why a conception of free will in this manner uh, does kind of make a lot more sense and also is more reflective of the actual state of things. But I'm gonna move on to premise number four, which is if it is the psyche which gives free will, then free will is not a metaphysical or spiritual aspect of the universe. It is an evolutionary aspect. Evolution produced the psyche because an organism with free will has an advantage over an organism without free will. Therefore, free will is purely a product of evolution. And this is kind of the problem with, I think, a lot of arguments against free will is that they seem to associate free will with like, with like an inherent metaphysical nature. And I don't think that actually makes a lot of sense. It makes more sense to think of free will as something that evolves naturally out of emergence um, in order to give the organism a, a, a greater chance of survival. And that's actually what I claim. An organism with more free will will actually have a better chance than an organism that's just kind of confined to fate. Um, and notice that because that has to do with the definition of, con of free will that we discussed earlier. It's the ability to escape fate in a sense. Um, and I can claim that sort of entities without a psyche 
uh, are consigned to fate, but entities with the psyche seem to be able to avoid destiny snare in very specific ways. Um, and that itself seems to be free will. So I, will, I want to provide a counter argument against free will. And the first argument against free, free will will be kind of the materialist argument. And I'll have this very nice lady from this YouTube channel explain this argument. Today I want to talk about an issue that must have occurred to everyone who spent some time thinking about physics which is that the idea of free will is both incompatible with the laws of nature and entirely meaningless. I know that a lot of people just do not want to believe this, but I think you are here to hear what the science says. So I will tell you what the science says. I explained what differential equations are and that all laws of nature, which we currently know, work with those differential equations. These laws have the common property that if you have an initial condition at one moment in time, for example the exact details of the particles in your brain and all your brain's inputs, then you can calculate what happens at any other moment in time from those initial conditions. This means in a nutshell that the whole story of the universe in every single detail was determined already at the Big Bang. We're just watching it play out. These deterministic laws of nature apply to you and your brain because you are made of particles. So to summarize her argument, it is essentially that kind of all the particles in existence obey certain laws, the same fundamental laws, and uh, these laws are predictable. And essentially the universe has just been kind of playing out these laws from past to present. Um, and these are, um, particles are more or less just on trajectories that were already kind of set at the beginning of time. And even like the atoms in your brain are just following these basic laws. Um, and there's nothing you can do to get around this fact. It's just, that's just kind of what's controlling your behavior. Um, and that's also what produces your consciousness. And that's kind of, you know, it since that's just kind of an automatic process, you don't actually have control over it. And you also notice that she says that her claim is backed up by science. And that if you deny this, that you're denying science. Um, and now I personally, think she's well-meaning here, but I would like to go on the record and say that science doesn't actually support her position. It, it supports certain assumptions about her position, uh, but mainly like how the physics particles and physical laws work. Uh, but then she extends that to imply something that isn't implied by those conditions. And I'll actually show that the fact that physical laws are predictable actually, in a sense, gives us more free will over them. Um, so actually, in a sense, what I'm arguing is that her premises are, are a better argument in favor of free will than against them. And of course, there is no experiment you could do to prove um, prove the, the non-existence of free will in the way she described. So it's a kind of like a non-scientific question, and yet she's saying it's backed up by science. But really, science hasn't approached that domain yet. But anyways, again, the argument is actually kind of sensible and logical. And I think this is a big reason why people generally believe it. Because if the universe is just composed of these particles, and these particles obey fundamental rules and do nothing else, there's just no getting around the fact that we can't control our destiny because it's just in the hands of kind of the momentums and positions of these particles. The problem with this is that the universe isn't just composed of particles. Um, now, if you're a materialist, that might sound crazy. And like, you may think that I'm trying to invoke religion or spirituality to kind of, or like the soul to kind of uh, justify my claims. But again, this is a false dichotomy. Materialism and science are not inherently compatible. There are possible worldviews um, that are in fact supported by just kind of logical <laughs> analysis of existence, which are also compatible with science. Um, so again, that's like a false dichotomy to just assume that if I'm not a materialist, that there's something spiritual going on. And again, I'll refer back to my original premise, premise one, where I state that the psyche is a thing that free will has produced. I don't know what the psyche is, but, but my experience does exist, right? When you close your eyes and imagine something that kind of does exist in a sense, is it composed of particles? If I open your brain, could I see that image? It, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, so clearly it is something different. It may depend on particles, but it's different from particles, right? But again, if your thoughts were generated by particles, we would be able to use just the information from the particles to construct your thoughts, which just seems like an absurdity. And again, you know, the thoughts in your brain are generated by particles. And the thing is, I actually don't agree with, don't disagree with this. The thoughts in your brain are generated by particles. Particle interactions are happening all the time. And we know that those are associated with your thoughts. What I think happens is when particles are arranged in a very particular way, they give rise to something new. And that something new is the psyche or the mind. And it's the mind that has free will. And again, the mind is not made of particles in and of itself. It's clearly involves particles, but it's not the same as particles. And once you wrap your mind around this idea, you'll actually begin to notice that like almost every experience, all knowledge of matter just comes through the psyche. For example, looking at things, um, what is color? You may think you know that color is, you know, uh, associated with certain wavelengths of light. Um, and that, ex that explains how like looking at different objects uh, produces color, but it doesn't explain what the color is in and of itself. It's something else. Um, like, in, and that, that's just true to the fact that color doesn't seem to be a property of the external environment. It's something that happens after certain wavelengths of light reach our eyes. What color actually is in and of itself is still mysterious. And I'll, you know, I'll actually post an Exerbia video because he actually explained this way more 
way better than I could. Um, and I really recommend you watch that if this if this idea confuses you because this idea itself, once you realize that it makes sense and is perfectly logical, is you can clearly see why it's this thing that gives you free will and it's also this thing that has free will. That the psyche is what I'm talking about. And so to resummarize what I'm saying is that these this collection of thoughts, this collection of a subjective experience that you're having, is the thing that can exert its influence over the physical world and thereby transcend physical laws and again, escape destiny snare. And evolution produced this thing for this purpose. Um, but you have to keep in mind that you don't have, that this doesn't necessarily mean you have absolute free will. It gives you a degree of free will, but again, free will is quantifiable. Um, and the, you know, depending on how your psyche is such so organized, you may have less free will or more free will. It really depends on the degree of sentience. Um, and again, you can imagine a being who is more intelligent than a human, and I would argue that this being would have more free will than a human. So we can combine all of these to, again, to make premise number five, which is that psyche has free will. Now you may be ra raising several objections to this idea, um, and I know because I have raised certain objections too, and I will address a bunch of them here. So the first thing is that what this implies is that imaginary things are real and that they influence reality. You can close your eyes and imagine like a three-headed tiger, um, but clearly that three-headed tiger isn't real. It's just an imaginary thing. And there's no way that ma imaginary things can influence reality. But, and that's true in a sense, there are no three-headed tigers, but that image does kind of exist in a sense, right? Like you can see it, like you close your eyes and you do see something, right? It is composed of something. And again, I don't disagree. It is, it, this thing is imaginary, but imaginary isn't exactly the opposite of real. It may not have a physical reality, um, but it does kind of have a psychic reality. And so maybe the better opposite of, of imaginary would be physical. Another objection that people have is that free will is an illusion and the psyche is also an illusion and that consciousness is an illusion. And if something is merely an illusion, how could it have free will? Um, I want to just, uh, I want to demonstrate that that's kind of an absurd purpose um, because imaginary things do kind of it, uh, obviously influence reality. Um, and again, consciousness may not be physical, uh, but it definitely is real. And it's definitely not merely an illusion because if it were merely an illusion, it wouldn't have any kind of functionality, but it clearly does have some functionality. So think back to what Sabine said, that everything is fundamentally governed by uh, fundamental particles. We can include this to extend the psyche. The psyche and consciousness is just a byproduct of neurons and neurotransmitters. It's an epiphenomenon and nothing else. Where the particles are the ride and your consciousness is like the passenger. Um, you're just kind of riding this universe, the particles of this universe, and it's taking you from place to place. And you, you can observe this happening through your mind, um, but your mind has no influence over the roller coaster. It just kind of goes where it goes and you watch it. Some people assert that this is all the mind is, a passive observer, uh, which watches the universe unfold, but it can't do anything else. That's what it means by an epiphenomenon, something that is kind of a byproduct. It doesn't have functionality in and of itself. I want to show why this is absurd. Firstly, you're telling me that evolution produced this insane apparatus known as the mind for no reason. I mean, if that were true, it would be better to have no psyche because you would literally just be a bunch of atoms which obey fundamental laws. You wouldn't be experiencing anything. You would just be kind of moving around. The particles in your body would be bouncing all around. Um, and that's how your behavior would uh, unfold. But it's very clear that evolution did produce a thing called the psyche. But like what materialists ultimately claim is that everybody is kind of a philosophical zombie um, because again, the psyche itself doesn't do anything. So it's just kind of like we're all watching this experience. I guess a philosophical, philosophical zombie would be a bit different because um, it doesn't have the experience at all. But materialists just go one step further and say, we do have an experience, but that experience doesn't do anything. And the second problem with this idea is that it is very evident that imaginary things do influence the real world. The idea of God, for example, seems to be imaginary, right? Um, I don't personally know for sure whether God exists, but let's just say for sure that God doesn't exist. That would put God, the idea of God, into the realm of the imaginary. But it is very clear that this imaginary thing, which again exists solely in our heads, does change human behavior. Some people will start sacrificing animals to such an imaginary deity. You know, and there's no there's no way to explain this behavior unless we posit that an imaginary thing is influencing people's minds. They are sacrificing goats because a god, which exists in their minds, is telling them to do so. So it clearly does have some influence in the real world. But this is actually not that absurd. Even like basic human things in society are based on imaginary principles. For example, governments and rules and morality and, you know, laws. Things like laws in the legal code don't actually exist. Like we just kind of make them up and kind of play an imaginary game where everybody agrees that these are the rules and that there are consequences for breaking them. But the rules don't exist in and of, them, of themselves. It's just, a, it's just a social contract. It's something that we exist in our heads um, that kind of produces an outcome when we all believe in it. Um, and so clearly the imagination does have an effect on reality. Even governments are like set up like this. We just, we kind of, 
the reason they work is because we all kind of have faith in them working. Um, even money is something like this. Money doesn't have an actual value. It's something our minds impose upon it. Um, it's in our heads. And yet by acting like it does have value, the world is significantly transformed. Perhaps not for the better, but still transformed. And furthermore, cars are imaginary. Yep, cars are imaginary. Cars aren't naturally occurring phenomenon. First, they exist solely within our minds. An inventor comes up with the idea of a car and it exists completely as an imaginary construct within his psyche. And through an act of will, they can manifest that purely imaginary idea into reality. You can't explain the process of invention or creation or art, or even like something like writing a book without positing the existence of a conscious psyche, which again, just kind of exists as our imaginations, but also pursuing that imagination seems to produce a real effect in the real world. And what I'm saying is the ability to write a book depends on your free will. First you imagine a book and then you kind of chase after this imagination. It doesn't exist, it doesn't exist in the real world, but by pursuing this imaginary idea, you transform reality and produce something that otherwise would not have existed. And like I said, that, that would be like saying computers are just naturally occurring phenomena because you just the universe just, you know, through particle interactions produce computers. Um, and I think the reason that sounds absurd is not because our minds are just bad at understanding things and we expect there to be free will. I think the reason that sounds absurd is because the idea of not having free will is in of itself absurd. The reason some of the ideas around the non-free will are absurd be is because the idea of the non-free will is absurd. It makes more logical sense for there to be free will. So anywho, I wanna get to premise six, which will hopefully clarify a lot of things, is that you have free will but probably not that much free will. Critics of free will tend to think of free will as like a yes or no question instead of a matter of quantity. Because if you treat free will as either a yes or a no question, any argument against free will can be construed as proving the non-existence of free will. Because if there's a problem with free will, the whole thing is dead. But the thing is, if you treat free will quantitatively, any argument against free will can be construed as rather a reduction in free will rather than a uh, denial of it. And so anything that counters your free will um, may actually be de demonstrative of you having less free will rather than you having no free will. You still have a free will. It's just that some extrane extraneous factor is um, reducing it. So to discuss it further, I want to play another clip of another critic of free will who starts by defining free will. So for ease's sake, I'll go with the most succinct and least controversial definition that I've been able to come up with, which is this. Free will is the ability to have acted differently. And what I mean by this is that if we were to wind back the clock in any situation, it was completely within the realm of possibility for you to have acted differently to the way that you actually did. So I'll start with this definition of free will. This is actually the perfect definition of free will. If free will is the ability to have decided otherwise and whether or not you can make your own decisions. What would have to be true in order for us to truly have total free will, to be able to have acted differently? Well, firstly, we would need to be aware of everything that is influencing our actions, including environmental factors, our precise mood, uh, the influence of other people, the influence of past experiences, and more. Secondly, we would need to be in complete control of every one of them. Neither of these are true or even possible. But he goes on to say that for this to be true, you would need to know everything, every single factor that went into any decision. Um, and because you can't, you don't have free will. My problem with this, again, is that it seems to place some ridiculous restrictions upon free will, and then using those restrictions produces the claim that free will doesn't exist. Namely that it has to be entirely your conscious self controlling you know, all of existence in order to have free will. The thing is, I don't actually view this as making sense with respect to whether or not you do have free will. There can be multiple factors influencing a decision, even unconsciously, and you can still have free will. Think about it like this, a CEO who has to decide whether to merge or not merge with another company. His subordinates might make a claim for why or why not he should or shouldn't do it. Uh, but the ultimate authority still lies with him. Yes, he was influenced by multiple people, but he still has the free will to decide yes or no. And again, the fact that things are determined by other things doesn't mean that we don't have free will. At the very least, it reduces free will, but that doesn't mean no free will at all. He then discusses the conditions needed to have total free will, but note the wording, total free will. Total free will is an absurdity because this would imply being a godlike entity that could control everything in the universe, including other people. But because we can't be this entity, and also because this entity can't logically exist, no one has free will. He then says that we need to be aware of everything that influences our actions. Again, an impossibility. And that because we can't be aware of everything, we don't have free will. Additionally, he says that we would need to be in complete control of every one of these factors. But the problem is, is that we can extend this indefinitely. For example, I can make the claim, you didn't choose your genetics, therefore you don't have free will. You didn't choose your parents, therefore you don't have free will. Because if you did have free will, you can also select ahead of time what genes you possess. But because you didn't, you don't have free will. And again, I, this is an example of one of those constrictions that does place restrictions on free will, but ultimately you still have free will. 
There are a million things around you and in your environment that are completely out of your control. And he's saying that in order to have free will, you have to have control over all of them. But that's only true if you define free will as absolute free will. But again, another absurd assumption of this is that in order to have free will, you would have had to have controlled every single event that's ever happened in history. And if for some reason you didn't control one of those events, you don't have free will. Again, this is what I mean by quantitative free will, because imagine an entity that could control everything, but then just forgot one thing, like was not able to control one thing. Would that entity just not have free will now? I think that's absurd. I think you do have free will. It's just that um, certain things and certain kind of extraneous factors, uh, and there are a huge number of these. Your genetics definitely reduce your free will because you didn't choose these, but you're still given a kind of realm in which you are able to exert your free will. Your psyche is able to kind of, uh, influence the world. These imaginary things inside your head are able to influence the world. Any kind of restriction on anything can be construed as an argument against free will. I can't break the laws of physics. Therefore, I don't have free will. You know, I can't just start flapping my arms and flying. Therefore, I get, I guess I'm not free. And in a sense, I am not free. There are restrictions. I can't just break the laws of physics. So I'm not like a totally free being. But again, restrictions on free will aren't the same as its non-existence. And then he goes on to make this related claim. So what would make me choose vanilla over chocolate? Well, there is only one possible answer, which I'll elaborate on shortly. I would need to want it more than chocolate. In order to choose vanilla, I'd need to want vanilla. Is this something I can control? Can I control what it is that I want? Not a chance. Consider the fact that you, presumably, don't want to punch your mother in the face. Can you choose to want to do that? This isn't the same thing as choosing to do it. Could you choose to want to? No, no more than I could choose to want vanilla over chocolate. The problem I have with this claim is, and this might sound a bit strange, is that it actually doesn't matter whether or not you can control your desires. The question or not is whether you can will your desires, which you seemingly can. So if you had to pick between vanilla or chocolate and you choose vanilla, he claims that this wasn't free because you didn't want to choose vanilla. That's just kind of how you are. But how is that relevant to the question of free will? The question is whether or not you can choose it, not whether or not you can decide to want it. You are the one who made the choice. Your psyche is the thing that commanded the body to do that. And you did so freely. Yes, certain factors influence that choice, but ultimately the main kind of authoritative uh, executive function part, your psyche, your head inside your mind was able to exert its free will. It had free will in that decision and you were actually free to choose otherwise. And this is why I need to add another premise, which will clarify things even more. Premise number seven, free will is not the ability to change the past. It's the ability to change the future. What happened in the past is kind of irrelevant. And this probably clarifies why I have such so many objections with this er arguments earlier is because he keeps construing free will as the ability to control everything that's ever happened to you in the past, including your parents. Uh, but that doesn't matter. What, what matters is your ability to change the future. From now on, can you affect the future? Assume you didn't have free will until right now. The question is, right now, can you change the future? And the answer is yes, but your ability to do so may be limited. Say, for example, you thoroughly enjoy drinking regular milk, but because you don't want to support the dairy industry, you just set, you instead decide to buy almond milk. So what happens when you need to peek between them? Let's just say, imagine they were both in the same aisle and you had to pick either the almond milk or the dairy milk. Your cravings may tell you to pick the regular milk, but your moral beliefs may make you want to pick the almond milk. Now, did you choose to crave milk? No, it was probably, you know, just something inherent. Either you were born with a predisposition to like milk, I guess, or maybe your parents impose it upon you and that's why you develop a taste for it. But this doesn't actually matter. You are still free in this particular situation to pick dairy milk. And in fact, according to the premise, another free will within you has the ability to pick the other milk. Your cravings have their own free will, uh, but your morality also has its own free will. And these can actually oppose each other, reducing the free will of either one of them. So what if you did actually pick the almond milk? Uh, well, we could say that morality, your mor moral side, kind of won in this decision. But cosmic skeptic seems to suggest is that you didn't choose to be a moral person, you just are. Um, or the idea of being a moral person came from somewhere else. And so you didn't freely choose it. Firstly, let's just say you are moral by nature. So it's just an inherent part of you. That would imply that you didn't choose to be moral, but in every instance, you can still choose or not choose to obey that morality. The past doesn't matter. How you became moral doesn't matter. The ability is whether in the present you can change to affect the future. What matters is what you choose to do with the time that is given to you, to quote Gandalf. But let's just say that this particular moral belief did come from someone else i.e. somebody told you that the cruelty of the dairy industry is what made you make this decision. You may be thinking this is where free will dies because if that idea came from someone else, um, it wasn't you who freely chose it. 
But here's the problem. It doesn't matter where the idea comes from. It matters whether that idea becomes integrated into that person's psyche. So now it's a part of their psyche. It's a part of their mind. And now can it act in the world with free will? Again, the psyche and the mind is the thing we're defining as having the free will. And in this case, it's the thing that decides not to choose the milk. And again, morality is just kind of this imaginary premise. Morality, it manifests into the world when we believe in it. And again, this belief this idea, which is solely a belief inside this guy's head and so constitutes a part of himself, is able to exert influence on the physical world, which it does in this case by not choosing the milk. Um, and like, you can't just conceptualize a person not choosing milk by just referring to the atom in, atoms in his body being motivated this way and that. It seems that a kind of psychic existence is a precondition for behavior like that. And so when somebody updates their idea of morality inside their minds, that idea becomes a part of them, their psyche, a part of themselves, so to speak. And this idea can exert free will. And it can even behave as the prime executor. And there's a perfect example of this. I actually forgot his name, so let me Google it. Hugh Clowers Thompson Jr. Um, from what I understand, he was a pilot during the Vietnam War. Um, and he came across a group of American soldiers basically doing very terrible things to a bunch of villagers, uh, executing numbers of them. Um, and he threatened to kill all of the soldiers if they didn't stop. He said that he would defend the soldier. Well, sorry, he would defend the villagers. Um, and that was an extremely noble and brave thing that he did. And what I'm saying is, is that the only thing that produced that, you know, a heroic decision was the idea of morality inside this guy's head. It's not the particles, not just the particles. He, he was able to force the particles to do something, to obey his moral beliefs. A completely fictional idea changed the world and changed this man's decision to make him do something extremely heroic and which everybody would agree is, a, is, you know, the right thing to do. But, you know, to be more specific, you don't need to be in control of everything that has ever happened in history to, in order to have free will. Okay, and then he makes this claim. But okay, let's go further, you say. Of course, I can't choose to want vanilla over chocolate when I really want chocolate, but what if I just decided in the full knowledge that I would prefer chocolate to go for vanilla anyway, just for the sake of regaining my free will and nothing else? Well, I'm afraid you'd still face the same problem. The exact same problem, in fact. In order to do that, you'd need to want to regain your free will as you see it. Why is your desire to prove a point like this stronger than the desire to have the ice cream you prefer? It just is. And if it happened not to be, you'd have chosen the ice cream that you do prefer. And so what I would say in response to this is that if you want to prove you have free will by choosing the other ice cream, you did actually have free will in that situation. Your pride freely willed to do that. Another part of you may have a will in an opposite direction, but overall, being the collection of these psychic, psychic substructures, um, the psychic substructures individually have free will and they can kind of also act together to give the organism more free will. He may claim that you didn't want to choose to have pride, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where the pride came up from. The pride itself still has free will. And he also says that you can't determine your wants. And I completely disagree with this. Firstly, you can determine your wants. You can, you're a being that can decide what you want. For example, do you want to go for a run or not for go for a run? Do you want to get clean off drugs or not get clean off drugs? Do you want to invent a nuclear power jetpack or not? You can actively contemplate the things you want and then modify them. You can be inspired by external ideas, which then enter your mind and then modify them in your head so that you can choose your what you want. You can change what you want because the idea of a jetpack powered by nuclear power um, doesn't actually exist in the real world. First, you conceptualize it in your mind and then you choose it. So you, what, what I'm trying to get at is that you can change and modify what you want. You actually can do this. You can, for example, many of your instincts want you to do something. You can choose to live in a way that is against your instincts. And so therefore, um, it's possible to modify what you want. And furthermore, consciousness is actually a, 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 a tool which enables even greater free will. So for example, if you're conscious of your previous desires, so like, you know, a very base desire would be a click on that thumbnail that I mentioned earlier of the hot girl. Um, that, that's what your instincts would be telling you to do. Um, but you have, you can kind of know about the fact that your body wants to do this thing. And then because you know about it, your consciousness knows about it. It can act in the other way and think, okay, I should not listen to my body. I should do, uh, this, you know, this more moral thing, which is say, and again, I think the, that the fact that we can obey our morality is indicative of the fact of our kind of choosing our own destiny. And the final thing I want to say about cosmic skeptics argument, I know I've been here for a while is that he says that your desire, for example, your desire to go to the gym, even though you don't feel about like it. So like, for example, if you're in this company, state of mind is stronger than your laziness and how this also doesn't point to free will and he says that it's simply stronger and you can't change that 
But I don't think this actually dispels the notion of free will because we have to ask what is causing the person to go to the gym? And that is because a person can envision themselves a healthier version of themselves which could potentially exist in the future. A healthier version of yourself doesn't exist, it's just in your head. It's an imaginary construct. But you can use your will to manifest this thing into existence by going to the gym. An imaginary idea can seize your particles and the particles of your body and force them to do something they wouldn't naturally do. And again, I don't see how this dispels the notion of free will. I'm sorry, like, uh, but I just don't see how, like, I don't, I personally don't see how uh, the conclusion you don't have free will follows from the premises because I can present the same premises and just, subs and just assert that there's free will and you can see that there kind of is. Uh, you can control your wants, you can modify your wants, and but there are many examples where even if you don't modify your wants, your wants still have free will. <laughs> and even if there's things that are opposing your free will, your genetics, you know, your biochemistry, the, your structure of your body, the structure of your sense organs, the, all of these things definitely limit free will but you still have free will. It's not, a, you know, it's not a lot of free will, but it is some. Now this brings me to the limit experiment, which I want to discuss in a lot more detail, uh, which is the experiment that shows that a brain scan uh, can re reveal a decision you are about to make even before you are conscious of the decision. And this would seemingly throw out the notion of free will. And there are actually a lot of problems with the limit experiment, like, um, and they don't, dispel the notion of free will, uh, but I'm just going to focus on one thing. And that is the fact that if we operate on the premises we have set up so far, um, remember the psyche is a thing that has free will and your unconscious psyche is still a part of your psyche. It was your psyche that decided to press the button. So you don't necessarily have to be conscious of a decision for you, your psyche, um, to, uh, to make a decision. Again, we have to define the psyche in a more complicated term. It isn't just your conscious self, but also your unconscious self, your unconscious psyche. Now you might be thinking that contradicts uh, what I said earlier, um, and that consciousness is the thing that gives you free will. I, consciousness is one of the things that gives you more free will, um, but ultimately your psyche overall has free will. But I do actually stay by the, stand by the claim that consciousness itself has its own free will because further kind of more limit experiments, you know, type experiments have shown that um, consciousness can actually modify a decision. So for example, you become conscious of the decision to do something, but now it becomes possible to do the opposite. Um, consciousness can flip-flop like that. So it can kind of override a decision made by the unconscious mind. Um, so consciousness itself does have free will and the unconscious mind also does have free will. The limit, you don't have to be, again, it, this, this idea only makes sense if you consider yourself to only be your conscious ego. Your conscious ego is an important part of yourself. And in fact, it gives you a lot more free will, um, but it isn't your entire self. You are still free and your psyche is still free. Now I'm gonna state another premise and that's premise eight. Free will doesn't merely consist in brain activity, but also actively pursuing a particular will. So you may have the thought to pick a particular button in the limit, limit experiment, but to actually do that thing is a different matter. We actually, we simplify free will too much to mean it to mean just your, your thoughts or just your actions, but it's actually a combination of thoughts and actions, multiple kind of components of your psyche have to be operating um, in order for free will to actually be achieved. So to make this claim clear, let's think back to a previous example. You can't decide your genetics, right? Um, you may think because you can't decide your genetics, you don't have free will because your behavior is to a large extent you know, controlled by the chemicals in your body. Hormones, for example. So for example, uh, a certain chemical imbalance may be causing your mood. Um, and you can't change this fact because this fact is predetermined, except you now know this fact and now you can change it. If you know that chemicals are responsible for your brain state, you can use this information to modify your brain state using chemicals. And again, this knowledge in your head is contained within your psyche, in your consciousness. And because of this knowledge, again, which is just in your head, you can manipulate biochemistry. You can take medicines which alter it. And so notice that not how knowledge of a fact gives you freedom to do something about it. When we're ignorant and know nothing about biology, these things kind of do determine us and there's nothing we can do about it. But when we understand them, you will actually be able to do something about it. In other words, higher consciousness produces more free will. What about your genes though? Like I said before, these are predetermined. You didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your genes. And so it would seem that you would have no free will because you can't change your genes, except you can change your genes. You can modify your genome. You can even do this um, to yourself. This has been, you know, kind of looked into for various treatments uh, where you can modify the genetic material of certain cells. And so again, this is only possible when you have a conceptualization of genes and then you have a, the conceptualization and understanding of gene editing with new information gives us new tools to change things which we before decided were inevitable. Um, and now imagine thinking like, um, imagine trying to dispel this notion by saying, well, you didn't decide, you didn't decide to want to change your genome, 
but you did because the only thing we can define as you is your psyche and your psyche is the thing which has the understanding of changing your genome and therefore the the capacity to change that genome and so what i'm again saying is that your consciousness seems to be able to escape destiny's snare it seems to be able to uh change the world in such a way that it has a better outcome for itself but more importantly it, because of the fact that it can understand the world deeply um it's able to kind of utilize those facts and uh exert itself and again it seems only that the psyche is the only capable thing of escaping destiny snare in this manner. But here comes an interesting conclusion. Premise number nine, because free will is quantitative, different free wills can be summed up to increase total free will. They can also be subtracted to decrease free will. So let's go back to the more simple example where like you have to either not click on the photo or click on the photo because you're doing nofap. Um, let's just say that temptation does get the best of you and you decide to click on the photo and you think to yourself, oh, what's the big deal? It's just one time. Well, in this case, your conscious mind, your thoughts, and your unconscious mind actually work together. And so their overall free will was large. And that's why you decided to click on the thumbnail. If your conscious mind instead opposes your unconscious mind, your unconscious mind will experience less free will, but it might still have enough free will to overpower the conscious mind. In other words, it kind of meets the threshold in order for the action to occur. What this implies is that if your psyche is harmonious and everything is this kind of harmonious totality and everything's pursuing the same goals, you will have more free will with respect to those goals. But somebody who's in a conflicted state of mind, who can't choose will actually be, have less free will. If the entire psyche is cooperative with each other, it can rapidly expand its free will. Again, I think this is a logical conclusion from what I've stated about free will. It kind of has to be true because think about a group of people. Does a group of people have free will? Like imagine if you were working on a project with uh, multiple people and everybody wants to finish it and con contribute overall. Everybody has the same goal in mind. What I'm saying is that this collection of people has its own free will. And of course that free will is actually greater than the sum of its parts. Wait, no, it's equal to the sum of its parts. Maybe it's greater. It could also be greater because of the property of emergence, but we'll see. So let's just say it's a business and one guy is designing the product and another guy is like working on the website. Uh, they both have consciousness in different domains. One is like a comp sci guy. The other is like a handy guy who can come up with the invention. And they also compensate for each other's lack of uh, consciousness in certain domains. So overall, the overall system has more free will and that makes them more capable of producing and accomplishing their goals. Uh, when we work on things together, when we all have the same goal in mind, um, it actually makes it more likely to do it. In other words, you can think of the lack of the inability to cooperate with other people as something which reduces free will. Uh, you still have free will, but it's just reduced. But if you can cooperate with other people, you can increase your free will by a large amount. But now imagine on the other hand, that somebody in the company wants to sabotage the company. They don't want to see it succeed. They don't have the same vision in mind. They want to see it burn. Uh, this person can actually reduce the free will of the group to overall, because the thing that they're trying to produce, the thing which is in their mind, what they're trying to manifest into reality, um, something is hindering that progress. And what this also implies is that somebody with more power has more free will. That's another thing that extends free will, literal power. An authoritarian government, assuming he can force anybody to do what he wants, would have a lot more free will. And that's actually why Caesar and Napoleon were just able to change history and like just change the world to their design because their will was imposed upon so many people uh, that they had a huge amount of it. In fact, their free will was so great that it seemed to reduce everybody else's free will. This idea that consciousness is what gives you free will might sound contradictory to the Libets experiment, but it really isn't because let's just say you want to invent something. Let's say you want to invent a new source of energy that's completely clean and will save the world. You might not have any say in why you want this. Let's just say like it inherent in you that you want to produce clean energy for some reason. That again is irrelevant. The, what's relevant is if you can hold that idea in mind and then pursue it such that it manifests into reality. So let's just say this person has researched different things and then the idea clicks. So something happens in her mind. Basically, I, information came from somewhere. Let's just say that wasn't free. Another, inf another information came from somewhere. Let's just say that also wasn't free. Let's just say both those instances, that person was in those situations completely passively and did not will them into being. With that information in her head, her psyche can take that information and produce something new out of it. For example, you understand nuclear fusion better um, and you also understand computers better and understand how a computer can kind of produce uh you know, fusion. I'm just making an example up, but what you say you understand those two concepts, which you got from two separate sources, your mind does a synthetic process to produce new information, to produce new ideas. Um, you know, not all of these ideas are viable, but perhaps you come up with an idea that is viable. Now you can manifest this purely new thing, which again, was a result of many influences. Um, but again, it's your will that e either enables it or doesn't enable it. You could fail in this task. And that means that your free will wasn't strong enough to actually meet the challenge, but your consciousness in this, um, 
in this example, even if your consciousness first starts in the unconscious and then kind of bubbles up, your consciousness is still playing a crucial role because in order to create that invention, you need to have a concept of it in your mind and hold it in mind and then manipulate it. And then, for example, you need to write down your sketches so that you have your sketches. Um, and that's the only way this invention comes about. And again, if you're purely a materialist, this doesn't make any sense because what exactly is that conceptualization? Like you have to kind of be able to see it in your mind for it to work. But again, a purely materialist paradigm kind of denies the existence of that internal psychic image. We can think about it like this. Imagine a simple organism, like a single cell bacteria, and imagine this bacteria had no psyche. It's as conscious as a rock. I would argue that this entity has no free will, and here's why. Let's say this bacteria eats sugar to survive. Um, so, and it can also move in its medium. So how does it decide where to go? Well, it has receptors on its body, which if there's a high concentration of sugar on one side and a low concentration of sugar on the other side, it heads in that direction. And this is a purely mechanical process. The detectors detect the sugar and releases a molecule, which releases like motor proteins and those motor proteins swim the uh, bacteria in that direction, completely, like, completely uh, governed by physical laws. Now I wanna show that this is qualitatively different from an organism that moves towards sugar because it can taste sugar. Taste is something else. Taste is a, another, it's a qualia. It's something that it's hard to describe the origins of taste exactly, but it's something else that the actual experience of taste, the subjective feeling is its own thing. And that specific thing can have free will. And it can actually, so for example, if a bacteria had the ability to sense sweetness and actually experience the sweetness, um, it would actually be able to pursue that sweetness in a more complicated manner. Because for example, like a bear, uh, as a better example, because a bear is actually sentient and therefore has a degree of free will. Um, if a beer tastes sweetness rather than just being attracted to sugar molecules, um, it can identify the thing that's been giving it the sweetness using its psyche and then kind of save a copy of that so that every time it sees that thing, it can eat it. Therefore, and, and I guess, in the, and in the bear's mind, it just knows that this sweet thing, this good thing is associated with this particular shape and this particular color. Um, and that's how the bear is able to more actively pursue that, that its psyche now can uh, have a greater degree of control over the body. Whereas, uh, um, an organism that just moves in the direction of sugar wouldn't be capable of doing this because um, it does its movement is completely based on things like that. It doesn't have a psyche to kind of build the external world inside of its own mind and then kind of make generalizations about that world. That like, for example, berries are sweet, so produ produce or pursue berries. So we can think of the universe as starting as just this thing that's composed of particles that just obey laws, but then something happens. Once sentience emerges and the psyche emerges, this psyche now has the capacity to transcend physical laws. That may sound like like super spiritual or whatever, but it's purely an evolutionary phenomenon, which gives the organism more free will. This is why I claim that animals have free will. They have less free will and kind of the less sentient an animal is, the less free will it has, the less potential uh, for flexibility in its behavior. Um, and more intelligent animals seem to have more free will than less intelligent animals. For example, a species of crow has been recently uh, observed pecking out the eyes of seals that sleep on the shore. Very gruesome actually, uh, but these crows had never been seen before doing this. So we believe that this is a new behavior. What I would argue is that crows being very intelligent use their free wills to, to kind of do this new thing that kind of isn't in their instincts. And because of it, because they were experimental in this way and just kind of testing things out, uh, it, it gave them a more a greater advantage. They've now found a different food source, although I'm not sure how reliable it would be. And you might be thinking, well, crows are just hungry. They're just following their hunger. There's no free will in that. And they didn't choose to be hungry. That was predetermined. Yes, hunger is predetermined. You don't choose to be hungry. But the possibility of a completely new behavior is only possible if the crow has some kind of an apparatus which makes new behaviors uh, flexible ideas like that possible. So yes, they were motivated by hunger. That was like the underlying motivation, but they still had the free will to pursue that hunger using a new thing. And again, it's hard to like accept this notion of free will because again, um, the crow's hunger did have free will because hunger is also a subjective feeling. And this subjective feeling actually motivates the animal even more and it gives it more free will to pursue that. Think about, think about it like this. Let's just say we all pursued hunger and that was it. That was like the main drive, okay? Everybody's just pursuing hunger. Do you not have free will? Well, actually you do have free will because you can choose to pursue that goal in different ways. You're free to do that. Even if we all had the same goal in mind and we all had predetermined goals, we're still free in the world to pursue those goals and choose how to pursue those goals. And 
recently has been shown, you can actually choose to not pursue that goal. You can feel hunger and then, but be a monk and decide not to eat, to fast, or certain religious beliefs choose to fast. They choose to go against their instincts. Again, the only thing that's influencing influencing that thought is a, an imaginary construct. But also, what's a, what's influencing a, a crow's ability to choose a new route to get more food is its psyche. Again, you don't. I don't necessarily think you have to choose your will in order for that will to be free. Your will can be determined, but that will in and of itself has free will. And you know, that's exactly what we're trying to say. The psyche is the thing that has free will. The psyche may have been predetermined, but it still has free will. They're not opposites to each other. The fact that the psyche enables free will is even clearer when we think about something like a hurricane. Whether satellites pick up information um, and that data can be used to predict out future outcomes. And this predictive capacity makes it possible to avert things which, were the, which would have otherwise been inevitable. If you see a hurricane coming, you can get out of the way. But the only way to predict a hurricane coming is to have enough knowledge about the weather and how weather models work. Um, and then you can use this knowledge to predict the course of the hurricane. And predicting the course of the hurricane gives us the best chance of evacuating the right people. So you can see something which is inevitable occurring using models that predict it, and then you can avoid them. This is an act of free will. It can't be explained any other way. Like you can say, yes, the only reason you wanted to survive is because it's built into you to survive, but you were still free to kind of figure out the way to survive, which is to evacuate. And you're also still free to use the information in different ways. Perhaps somebody wants to stay during the hurricane to film it. The, the point is you're free no matter which you choose, but you're more free if you have the correct information. If an asteroid were hurtling towards Earth, we could either be resigned and just think, well, this is inevitable. There's nothing we can do about it. We're just going to die. Or we can change something which just a few hundred years ago would have been inevitable. We know the laws of physics, which again exist in our heads, and we can create instruments that tell us where the asteroid is. And if enough people work together, use all of their free wills, um, they can accomplish something which would otherwise seem impossible. We can find a way to avoid the disaster. Now try to explain that without free will. It just seems nonsensical. You could say that we didn't choose the desire to survive. We were just born with it, but a will is a will. The desire to survive is itself a kind of will and that will is free. And free will is not the ability to change the past. Free will is the ability to envision a, a future and then manifest that future into existence. You using a psyche can envision a particular future, one where you wrote a book, one where you went to the gym more often, or one where you were a more moral person. You can will that future into existence. You may not succeed because you aren't totally free, but you are still free to do it. Now you might be saying, or you may have had the thought if you made it this far, um, that we don't know what the psyche is. And so it's kind of dumb to conclusively say that it gives you free will and therefore that this argument is invalid. And it's true. We don't know what the psyche is. But we also don't, in a way, know what matter is. Yes, we give different particles different names, but we don't know fundamentally what those are at a fundamental level. What are the atoms in and of themselves? But of course, this isn't a problem for materialism. For materialism, just observes the world as it exists and can determine physical laws of these particles. We don't necessarily need to know what they are to be able to make statements about um, about materialism and about the physical universe. In the same way, we don't necessarily need to know what the psyche is. What we need to be able to see is how it functions and how it functions seems to be the free will mechanism that I've been describing earlier. And so even if we don't know what the psyche is, it doesn't really matter because we can see what the psyche's function is. We can see that imaginary things have an influence on reality. The imaginary idea of God has an influence on reality and that itself is indicative of the fact that the psyche manifests and does something which is different from just natural laws. Now, I know this video has been long and you can kind of just cut it here if you're bored, but now for the really hardcore people, you're the people who I make videos for. Um, I, I want to get more rigorous and actually delve into the physics and even show that from just looking at the world and looking and understanding a certain amount of physics will show you that free will definitely exists. Remember at the beginning, I said you can envision an, envision an entity that has the absolute maximum free will. Well, this entity is Laplace's demon. Imagine a being that could see every particle in the universe and know their positions and velocities, just see everything whizzing around. Of such a being would be capable of knowing the entire future because it would be able to see every particle and it knows all the rules of particles so we could see just how things will evolve into the future. The thing is, there's a problem with this idea, and that is quantum mechanics. It's actually impossible to know some properties of a particle with absolute certainty. This is known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, and we don't have to get super complicated about it, but essentially pinpointing a particle's position actually causes it to have an undefined momentum. You can't know both simultaneously, and that's just built into it. You can't know both of them simultaneously. So you can get information, but you always sacrifice other information. But here's the thing. If this entity could see the future and perhaps it could just see, you know, almost all of the particles, like it, it, it had uh, enough information to still determine the future, 
it would be able to change the future. We've already established that consciousness of the future makes it possible to switch to an alternative future. But if you were conscious of everything, you would be able to decide whatever future you wanted. But here's the paradox we've already established. That's already impossible. Having enough information about a thing causes it to change. For example, if you wanted to pinpoint the position of an electron, you would need to focus of an extremely high frequency of light in order to find it. But doing this actually changes the electron. We will know its position, but by interacting with it, we will have caused its momentum to change. And again, we can't know both simultaneously. This act actually produces new information. And it seems that consciousness, for some bizarre reason, is able to retain in this kind of information. The thing is, we are actually measuring quantum information all the time. A lot of people claim that we can't influence the quantum world and therefore we don't have free will. Except knowing quantum mechanics does allow us to manipulate the, the quantum world. What do you think a quantum computer is? But you don't even need to know everything about quantum mechanics for this to be true. For example, touching something. When you touch something, the electrons in your skin repel against the electrons in the object. But by doing this, you're interacting with those electrons, and so you're momentarily causing them to have a more defined position. So not only do you create quantum information by doing this, you're creating the positions of those electrons, you're also, your brain is also retaining an, a record of that information. You touch something and you subjectively feel that it's hard. That means you can't go through it, and so your brain knows um, that there's an object there. So not only do you create quantum information, your brain is actually able to retain some of that information by converting it into a psychic experience, i.e. the subjective feeling whenever you touch something. And this information tells you properties about the object. But remember, any act of obtaining quantum information produces new information. And producing new information means changing the world. So if you envision the world as just kind of like this, these particles moving around and you can't change them, um, then all the information in the universe would be known. It would be impossible to produce new information. Except by this mechanism, it seems that we're able to actually produce new quantum information and that's how a new future can unfold. The unpredictability of quantum mechanics kind of leaves open this probability space of multiple futures. So you can imagine like the um, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and you can think of it like this. There are multiple possible alternative futures. You can actually using you know using the ability to select these quantum futures choose the future you want even in your local region of space time um, other people may be trying to choose alternative futures but in their local regions they can exert their free will it's just that they can't exert their free will on the entire universe only within like kind of, kind of like a small area of space and this isn't i mean this may sound like some crazy claim that i'm making but it's actually pretty intuitive let's just say imagine you see a ball flying towards you which means the photons from a flying baseball are entering your eye before the baseball has reached you. So the photons first give off the information that they're coming towards your eye. Now here's the thing. Those photons, as they fly towards you, give you information about the position and velocity of that ball. And the thing is, that ball is also a quantum object. It's composed of millions of particles, billions of particles, and trillions of particles, and all together it's kind of like a quantum object, a big quantum object. But because the photons are reaching your eyes, the positions of the position of that quantum object is being revealed. It becomes revealed to your mind. Your mind, in a sense, is able to retain a record and produce a new copy of the information of the fact that the ball is flying towards you. So the ball is flying towards you, you see it, you know its position and its velocity. Now you can move. You can move out of the way. You can pick a future where you don't get hit by it. Uh, you change the kind of inevitable outcome by just kind of observing a thing with your mind. Now, it's actually a lot more complicated than this, but one of the other kind of conclusions you can draw from this is that this gives you a way to calculate the amount of free will you have because it seems to be a function of the amount of information your brain can have. And if this is super complicated because it's not exactly clear, you know, how much information is in one pixel of, of, of red light? How much information is in imagination of an, of an elephant? Um, so it's hard to actually pinpoint the amount of information that the psyche can store, but if we can figure it out, uh, we'll be able to figure out how much free will a thing has. And by showing that, we would show that free will exists. So premise number nine, the fact that new information can be produced makes it possible to select amongst possible futures. If information could not new be newly produced, the future would be determined and even consciousness would not be able to change that. So this basically means that the randomness of quantum levels at the kind of micro macroscopic levels is actually how consciousness uh, can produce a new future even in a deterministic universe. In fact, the deterministic universe is a condition for free will because if the universe was totally completely random, um, it would be completely impossible to determine. But the fact that some of it's determinable and some of it's not determinable, these are the conditions needed for there to be free will true free will. And there's another quantum mechanical explanation. It has to do with the property of entanglement. What I basically claim is that evolution has found a way to utilize quantum principles to exert its own free will. This is how ultimately those crows figured out how to eat the eyeballs. Entanglement. This isn't that crazy if you think about it. 
Let's think about your mind and the body and go back to the example of the baseball. If you see the baseball at the distance, it means that in a sense, you are entangled with that baseball. You can even show this. Uh, maybe I'll show it in the future with more sophisticated diagrams. But the fact that the photons of that baseball are reaching you, they're entangling you with the system. And that entanglement kind of scrambles quantum information and makes a new kind of uh, it changes the game, so to speak. Let's just say the world was going to happen a certain way. Entanglement and then the conscious ability to know about that entanglement are not necessarily the entanglement itself, but some conscious property which gives you information uh, makes it possible to sidestep the universe, so to speak. This implies actually you can gain free will. You right now probably have more free will uh, just for after watching this video, but you may have come at the sacrifice of other free will. For example, if you lost a certain knowledge, your ability to produce a certain outcome may be affected. But you can gain free will from multiple different places. Let's say I read one book about electricity and then another book about computation. Well, now the information is within me to produce something new. Yes, the original information came from other sources, but the synthesis occurred in my head. And then I pursued that idea to exert my free will. So that's where I'm going to end this. Holy shit, I talked so much. Um, definitely amongst one of my longer videos, perhaps not coherent, um, but I really want to make sure that I made my point clear, hopefully. Um, if it wasn't clear, let me know <laughs> because, um, yeah, this was a long one and maybe I'm completely crazy. Holy shit, I'm still talking. Okay, see ya. Bye.